My name is Jim Caseman. Welcome back. We're talking about how to get to know God intimately. Now, the truth is, there are a lot of Christians that know some things about God, but they don't know him. They don't know him intimately. They don't spend time talking to him daily. And, of course, they, they, they have very, most Christians are not even aware of the fact that when they ask Jesus to come into their heart to be their Lord and their Master, and they're born again, that they've now also, not only are they born again and become part of the family of God, but they're also in blood covenant with the creator of this universe. They don't talk about blood covenant. They don't understand blood covenant. The pastor's not teaching them about blood covenant. And consequently, most Christians are not experiencing the full blessings that God would have for them, which could only come through an understanding of the blood covenant and having faith in it and exercising your faith in it. And so we're talking about how to get to know God intimately. Well, we want to get to know, like it says in, uh, well, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 through 22. We just thank God for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God and in the exceeding great power of God, that we'd understand that. And Colossians 1, chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, it is God's will for us to understand his will in all which is his word in all wisdom and spiritual understanding we need spiritual understanding and most christians don't have spiritual understanding they've been the what they do know is basically with the five physical senses and their natural mind god so loved the world he sent his only begotten son who's living shall not perish but everlasting life they don't really even know what that means other than, well, he died for me, I can get saved. But if we're going to get to know God intimately, we have to get to know why he, why is he working through blood covenant and, and, and expects us to, because we are in the new blood covenant. And God only works with people through blood covenant. All right, so then, that takes us then to Genesis chapter 15. Now, we're going to talk, the Hebrew men, we mentioned this some sessions back, we talked about the different steps that Hebrew men would go through in cutting covenant. Now, Abraham, or Abram at this point, he understands and he's used to cutting covenant. The Hebrew men, that's what they practiced. Now, of course, the devil takes everything, the devil can't create anything, we found out, but he takes the things that God creates and then he perverts them. So he's taken blood covenant and perverted it. It's crazy. And how the, the, the Satan worshipers and all of these people actually work with blood covenant. But it's a perversion of what God created. And certainly <laughs> what they practice in their blood covenant is not in line with the word of God. But there's the real thing. There's always the real thing. Satan counterfeits. He perverts, he counterfeits everything God creates. But then there's always the real thing. So we want to be sure that we understand the truth, the real thing, and how the real thing works. <laughs> All right. So then we come now to Genesis 15. And uh, verse 1, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord, God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the heir of my house of El Zir of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're not able to number them. And he said to them, so shall your descendants be. And we already talked about how uh, God would, uh, through Abram, a great nation would come. And, of course, verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Abraham believed in what God was going to do in regards to the redemption of mankind. And that was accounted unto him for righteousness. 
In other words, when his body died, he would go to heaven. He wouldn't be able to enter the most holy place, but he'd go to heaven, wouldn't be born again. Now, all the Old Testament saints that went ahead of us couldn't be born again, but they're in paradise. They're in heaven. And they, could, and they were waiting for the Redeemer to come, the Lamb of God, Jesus, who ultimately would pay the death penalty for mankind's sins, and then all of mankind could be born again, could receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, their nature would be changed from the nature of sin to the nature of God. And uh, that happened. And when Jesus then sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in the most holy place after he was resurrected from the dead, um, mankind's sins were forgiven. The debt of guilt was paid. And all of the Old Testament saints in paradise received the new nature. They were born again. There's a principle in the scriptures that we here on earth that are alive, we do not, we do not receive things ahead of them. Like in the catching up of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4, 4. The dead were raised first and given glorified bodies. Then, then those on earth then were caught up. And, uh, and um, so that's, that's the way it works. <laughs> so they received the life of God before we did. And then on the same day, of course, Jesus came right back down on the earth and, uh, and he breathed on the disciples and they were born again. All right. So it's accounted unto them. Now for you and I, See, it was accounted to him to do for uh, uh, what he believed in what God was going to do. And actually, that was four, about 4,000 years down the road before Jesus appeared. Now, for you and I, we, it's a, a, we, we believe in what God has already done. And so, not only is it accounted unto the righteous, but we're born again and we become new creations in Christ Jesus. According to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And uh, that we might become, uh, have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, where we'd come, where we also, like Jesus, would have, have absolute power over all darkness and everything else, that sin, death, and Satan would have no power in our lives. All right, well, anyway, we talked about that before, but it's all right to kind of, Rehearse some of these things. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur er to the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Now they're talking about natural land. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a, a, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. All right. So now God's going to enter into covenant with Abram. He works with blood covenant. He promised him the land. And through the blood covenant, Abram would get the land, as we saw at the end of the chapter. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I've given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Ken Kenasites, and the Kadomites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, the Ritham, boy, I'm not doing good pronouncing those, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Jagasites, and the Jagasites. Well, we saw how all that happened when they came out of the, uh, out of the uh, wilderness, and they started inheriting the land that was giving to them, and... Uh, that's another subject which we may have a chance to talk about later. But anyway, Abraham would receive the land through the new blood covenant. But now, we're beginning to see here that God had something else in mind besides the land. Now, he promised Abraham three things. And what was that? That he'd not only have land, but he'd become a great nation and he'd be a blessing to other people. So there's three things total that he promised Abraham. On one of them was the land, but not only this physical land, but we also saw in the book of Hebrews that these patriarchs desired a heavenly country. They really were looking forward to that heavenly country, that heavenly land. And the land here that they receive in the natural realm is just a foreshadowing of what they would receive ultimately uh, down the road. Glory be to God. Well, our time is up and we'll continue 
as soon as we get back. So meanwhile, you just be blessed in everything that you set your hands to do.